1935. Diamond Head on the island of Oahu became the visual checkpoint for Hickam, a new army field which was dedicated that spring. It was not until 1937 that Hickam was built up as a major air depot and homing station for a complete wing. Situated at the entrance to Pearl Harbor, this field became air defense center of Hawaii. After 20 years, the War Department had finally given these volcanic islands recognition as an overseas garrison. Eventual home for the Hawaiian Air Force, the Pacific Paradise easily won a reputation among airmen as being a good deal. When the volcano Mauna Loa on Hawaii suddenly became active, the government called on the Army Air Corps to bomb the lava flow and try to save Hilo City. We still welcomed every chance to serve the public and win their support. The antique bombers were gassed up and the bombs were fused, ready for the operation. Then the towerman gave us the takeoff signal. Five Keystone bombers of the 5th Composite Group, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Asa Duncan, headed for the target. A river of fiery lava which relentlessly flowed 800 feet an hour toward the city. Correcting his sight, my bombardier signaled for release of the first bomb. In all, we smashed 6,000 pounds of high explosives at the lava stream and its source. Within two days after the bombing, the river of fire slowed, then stopped completely. And Hilo City was saved by air power. March 1935, General Orders established the GHQ Air Force, an important advance. This meant that a large part of national defense was entrusted to the Air Corps' handful of men, although they constituted only 11% of total U.S. Army strength. The plan was under command of Air Pioneer Brigadier General Frank Andrews, who announced that GHQ had set up three combat wings bedecked in camouflage. One at Langley Field, Virginia, for the east. One at Marchfield, California, with aerial forces to protect the west. And one at Barksdale Field, Louisiana, ready for any emergency. Thus, the nation was provided with small mobile air forces, theoretically capable of spotting and intercepting an enemy before he could get within striking distance. And if necessary, planes could be dispatched to reinforce American bases in Hawaii, Panama, or Alaska. Under GHQ, the role of aircraft in coastal defense was also recognized. We helped Andrews, a flying general, prepare to beat the Lindbergh record by using a Martin B-12, fitted with flotation gear. Two 1,100-pound bombs served as payload for the speed test over the 621-mile course. A pair of supercharged 750-horsepower engines easily lifted the huge amphibian off the bay. Flying from Langley Field, Virginia, to Bennett Field, New York, and returned, Army engineer timekeepers tracking the entire flight clocked Andrews at 165 miles an hour, whereby he established three new world records for seaplanes and advanced American air power. In the interest of scientific research, an historic flight was made on Armistice Day 1935 from the Strato Bowl in South Dakota. Jointly sponsored by the Army Air Corps and the National Geographic Society, the world's largest balloon was made ready by an army of soldiers, technicians, and scientists. This was to be the climax to years of work by men like Dr. Lyman Briggs, Air Corps Chief General Oscar Westover, and Captains Albert Stevens and Orville Anderson. It was a proud moment for the three Army airmen. Shortly before the ascent, Stevens joined Anderson inside the nine-foot sphere to check the ton of delicate scientific instruments which they had installed to investigate the sky. They carried cameras, a spectrograph, a radio transmitter, even Geiger counters. Within a necklace of floodlights, the giant mushroom was filled with helium gas. Zero hour and all aboard. Attaching the sphere to the fully inflated and rising balloons was a most delicate operation. They're off. Anderson on top side to release ballast to clear the hill. The two flyers reached the greatest height known to man, 14 miles. After eight hours, they made an eggshell landing and brought back valuable knowledge on weather, cosmic rays, radio, and mapping. 
This was a remarkable expedition on the battlefront of Zion. Weather conditions in the spring of 1936 produced unprecedented floods in the eastern states. To survey this national emergency, we dispatched the Army flagship, the Douglas C-32, fitted with the very latest communication equipment. Expert observers plotted the rescue work and sent out a call to the second bomb group at Langley Field, Virginia. When the order was received, weather and intelligence officers briefed the crews for the emergency mission. 30 B-10 bombers, 45 officers, and nearly 100 enlisted men, under command of Major Robert Cronau, took part in this latest Air Corps effort to fight disaster. Blood damage was the greatest of records as the B-10s flew over the swollen James, Potomac, Susquehanna, and Ohio rivers. Over the drop zone, 8,000 pounds of medicines, clothing, and food fell on isolated Pennsylvania communities. Thus, the Air Corps played a major role in alleviating human suffering at a time of great need by quickly converting its weapons of war to wings of mercy. Meanwhile, Japan was still making a bid for world power with her undeclared war against China. We didn't know that by the end of 1937, Jap pilots were training for Pearl Harbor as her relatively modern air force ruled the sky over China. Other totalitarian nations like Italy were also testing their air forces in actual war on a scale unknown since 1918. Her soldiers and airmen were led into an unwarranted campaign of aggression against her helpless neighbor, Ethiopia, by Premier Benito Mussolini, an accomplished public rabble-rouser. In a country so primitive, there was no real opposition. To Mussolini's pilots, bomb strikes on native troops appeared like flowers bursting into bloom. The day he went before the League of Nations, Haley Selassie knew he would plead in vain. He stated that Italian aircraft had hurled gas and death upon his people and asked if the free world intended to bow before force. A few days later, the League of Nations went out of business. That's when the American press started wondering why U.S. air power was falling so far behind Italy, France, Russia, and Britain. As a correspondent, I went to the War Department. Air Corps leaders showed me what they were doing with limited funds. I was surprised to find that working with American industry, the generals had started planning a long-range heavy bomber as early as 1933. Specifications had asked for an aerial dreadnought of tremendous capability. These requirements of speed, range, load, and ceiling had posed many problems for the designers. I discovered that among the models submitted was this revolutionary design from Boeing calling for four engines. If accepted, it would become a flying battleship, 68 feet long with a wingspan of 104 feet. Along with the model, Boeing engineers had prepared a detailed proposal which they submitted to the Materiel Division. Then I learned that in June 1934, Boeing received a contract from the Army for design data, a full-scale wooden mock-up, and complete wind tunnel tests on their proposal. Later, with many changes and suggestions, the Army Inspection Board approved construction of only one experimental plane. But so great was Boeing's faith in their idea, they borrowed money and staked their future on building the single B-17. Because this airplane was being constructed in competition, there was no financial support from the government. Instead, there is considerable skepticism and opposition. Therefore, it was strictly a pioneering venture, even to the wooden scaffolding and the custom-made parts and instruments. Building the first four-engine bomber was a great gamble. No one would have thought that this maze of metal taking shape in the Boeing plant was to become one of the major weapons to fight for freedom a few years later. June 1935, the men who built her rolled the baby out into the sun. She looked magnificent. So good, they called her a flying fortress, and the name stuck. If she worked, the XB-17 would be the biggest single step toward advancement of American air power. Now, with the Army Air Corps acceptor. 
The Giant was groomed and ready for a back-breaking test. And the XB-17 pointed at its sharp nose to the east and with a great surge of power soared into the air. Past Mount Rainier, the majestically sweeping design with feather-like maneuverability surpassed even the best hopes of its designer. The bomber flew the record-shattering 2,100 miles non-stop in exactly nine hours at an average speed of 232 miles an hour. The basic Air Corps specifications were met as the plane came to rest at Wright Field, Ohio. For two months, Air Corps engineers tested the B-17. Few other planes were equally important in air history. Then came the day of the big test. October 30, 1935, and before the very eyes of the Army brass who had come to decide on it, high hopes were shaken. Every one of us who had worked for the perfect defense weapon saw our creation go up in smoke. But Air Corps Chief General Westover immediately took up the battle. After several months of investigation, the plane was cleared of any mechanical fault. The B-17 could not be ignored because of an accident. More of these four-engine bombers had to be built. Men and machines went back to work, and American air power marched on. Machinists, metal workers, small parts men, the skilled hands of America's great industrial wealth were back at their benches, performing millions of precision aviation tasks contract for construction of a service test fleet of 13 airplanes had been awarded the Boeing Company by far-sighted leaders of the Air Corps. Although this contract was completed with horse and buggy production methods, the dreams of men like Generals Westover and Andrews were being fulfilled. They claimed the airplane had brought into being a different mode of warfare, the application of air power. And with a B-17, they hoped to give America the weapon which could engage any enemy on land, sea, and in the air, destroy his war production and will to fight. However, it wasn't until spring 1937 that this new air power began to arrive, when the first B-17s were delivered to the second bomb group. The Air Corps was finally being equipped with weapons equal to any military plane in design, speed, endurance. Before the end of World War II, production increased a thousandfold, giving us more than 12,000 flying fortresses. In later chapters, we shall see America's air power grow. And when the big test came in 1941, there was both a doctrine of air warfare and fully tested airplane designs in the strong hands of the United States Air Force.